my book book two on Jack's Learn Corner, and it's time for part two of my winter TBR or potential reads. Um, so hopefully I won't cough again, although I can already feel it. But just like last time, I apologize. I just started getting sick again, but I want to make you guys another video. So, um, now we're on to the other pile. Okay, so let's see how I have these ordered. Okay, so these first ones are ones I don't really have. Well, let me start with a pile of a category. Okay, so first, this is my science fiction pile. Um, so we have Children of Dune. In the last video I mentioned, I was debating about buying the God Emperor Dune. Let me see if that is actually the next one. I really appreciate that these books have the list of the books in order. Yeah, the God Emperor or Dune is the next one. Although, like I said, with the way my mom is feeling, we're probably not going to go. I'm probably not going anywhere anytime soon. So, um. So, yeah, I need to buy that one. But this is the. Which book? Oh, sorry, I have to look again. I think it's book three. It's book three, I think. Yeah, it's book three. And then Gone and Burned was the fourth book. Um so I debated about getting this one sooner rather than later, but I mean not this one, but the next one. Um so I can jump into the next one right away after I finish this one or whenever I want to. But um this is kind of a um this is the next one I wanna read. This is my sci fi category. And um I'm really enjoying this series. I mean, the writing style is still hard for me to get used to. Um, but I still like, I still think the story is really cool. And I like the whole desert planet concept. And I'm just wondering, and I'm wondering where it's going to go from here. Um, I think it's about the children of, um, of Paul and... Of the children of Paul, I believe the second, this third one is going by the children of Dune, by the title. So, um, make it do. And then, next sci fi I have in this pile, and I was trying really hard not to pick out because there's a couple other sci fi's that I wanted to get to that I want to check out. But I was trying to save those. And this is an actual non fiction, an actual science, science story, um, science thing. This Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin. I'm a little apprehensive about this because I don't know if I'll get into it or not. Be able to get into it or not. I'm worried that I might be bored. But, I mean, I did read the first couple pages and I was kind of found it interesting. Um, I am definitely intrigued with the whole survival of the fittest concept that Charles Darwin came up with. And it is written kind of like a diary, if I remember correctly. Um... I've always, Darwin is someone I've always heard a lot about. I mean, and even in one of those cartoons that was the British cartoon, or claymation, I should say. It's kind of like Mom, Wallace and Gromit style type cartoon. That was how it was, where you have this guy going on an adventure and he runs into Charles Darwin, who accompanies him. Um, And I think it was right before the... Right before he goes on his, right before he writes his book, or goes on the journey on the Beagle, I think, um, in the animated, fe in the, in the feature, and he's actually voiced by David Tennant, but, um, you know, so I thought, I decided to go ahead, and I saw this at the roast office, and thought, why don't I check it out, why don't I, tr you know, but I, I'm just, I'm not pretty, I'm definitely nervous. I'm definitely concerned because I'm still kind of easy my way into sci-fi. Um, and then I have, I put the, I feel like the apocalypse type stories are very sci-fi. Sci um, so we have, this would take me forever to read. But this is The Stand by Stephen King. And I already started reading this when I had the mass market copy of it. But like. You know, I've said a million times before, I've been switching out my mass markets for regular size paperbacks. Um, and this is kind of an apocalypse story. Like, half the planet is wiped out by a virus. And, you know, people 
going to this woman. Her name's Abigail, I think. Um, Mother Abigail. She is this woman, 180-year-old woman who can heal people. But then, um, you have half the other population, the other half of the remaining population going to Randall Flagg, who is a, um, he delights in chaos and violence. <laughs> and, I mean, it actually doesn't, it does not say that on here. That was me, actually. It actually says, a Randall Flagg, the, nefer the nefarious drug man who delights in chaos and violence. Well, okay, the delights in chaos and violence, I did not come up with this. That doesn't, that does stand on here. And it's kind of a good versus evil dynamic. Um, and I think the latest movie adaptation or TV show adaptation, I still I have not heard anything about it. As Whoopi Goldberg and as Ab Mother Abigail and um, not Stellan Skarsgård, his son. The one who he played, um, he played Eric in in um true blood cannot think of his name but he plays randall flag and this has been adapted before and i do have the miniseries i want to finish and read the book before i read them before i watch the miniseries but i don't know when that's gonna be so maybe i should just go ahead and watch the miniseries um although i really think you should try to save that for like if it's a um if it's like an older book then maybe yeah you can do the well you know what actually people can do whatever they want but I like to try to save adaptations for after I've read the book. Like, especially now, the last few years. Um, but I think with the set, when, I think, with the exception of older class, you know, classic older books, I think with older books, it's okay to watch the adaptation, for, to watch the adaptation first before you read the book, because it can kind of help you understand what's going on in the story. So, um, and then the last sci-fi for the sci-fi pile I have is Children of Time. Um, and this is, I believe, the first book in a trilogy or a series where, um, you have these humans send out this, um, okay, so they left it out of Dying Earth. They sent out some something that made these spiders really smart. Or they did this test on these monkeys and it didn't work on the monkeys. But it got infected and sent to the, uh, an alien planet full of these spiders. And they made the spider super smart and really big. Think like Aragog from Harry Potter. And, um... You have this, these scientists, this group still, some of, like, one of the main scientists is still alive, I think, and she, <coughs> damn it, I'm trying not to cough, I'm trying to get through this because I want to do these videos, but I don't know how long I'm, I'm going to be sick, like I said last time, at least this, like I said in the last video, at least this time I could take medicine, but I'm still, still got that tickle in my throat. Um, but obviously I read a little bit of it so far and I like it, but it's, you know, the science, I get hung up on the science a lot. Um, I'm more of a, you know, literature person than a science person. Um, I mean, I did okay in science class in school, but it was never my forte. But I still want to get into science fiction. That's why I think I prefer the science fiction that's kind of a little more like, has a little bit of a fantasiness to it. Like, blurs the line between fantasy and sci-fi. Where, um, where it's almost like, like magic in science. And, like, it's very low sci-fi. Um, like, I love the Lunar Chronicles. Um, but I'm still gonna try, I'm still working on it. Okay, so that's a sci-fi pile. Um, and then I have, this, well, this, the first star now is kind of a, Rome, his Roman history pile, but I also put this book in there as well, Paradise Lost by John Milton, um, the epic poem about Adam and Eve and, um, the, the being kicked out of the Garden of Eden and the fall of Lucifer. It's John Milton's, 
version, his epic poem about that whole history. And, um, I, I mean, I have read some of it, obviously, but I want to, it's been so long though, I want to read Rain and Start Over. Um, I keep debating about bringing him with me when we go traveling or my sister my, or my grandmother's, especially my dad is with me, so that maybe he can, we can go over together. Of course, he's also driving most of the time, so, um, and when we get to those places, there's really not a, um, it'd be a very interesting discussion if we, if the Wilson family talks about this book. Um, but, yeah. So, I didn't include it in this pile that I'm going to show you, even though it doesn't really fit the theme of this pile, but I have been wanting to come back to this. This along with the um, Divine Comedy. <coughs> <coughs> this along with the Divine Comedy by um, Dante. But right now, I'm kind of trying to stick with finishing this one first. But I love this painting. And this is the... This is the original painting in the in the back at the bottom here. It shows the original painting of this cover. So there's more to this cover there's more to this painting than what's on the cover. Um but I think I some of some of these covers of these mass of these classics, I like it. I like it. But some of them I find it's funny because I've seen the same painting on two different books. And sometimes I don't think the the, the painting on the cover really depicts accurately. Like it doesn't fit to me. Okay, so there is that pile. I mean, I mean there's the first book in the first book in that pile. Okay, and then now we're onto the actual Well, actually there's two books that aren't technically Roman related. But and then we have Edward Gibbon The History and Decline The History of the of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Um, and this is, I think, volume one. Like, I think there's a lot more to this by Gibbon, um, Edward Gibbon. And I had heard about this from Steve Donahue, because he did a march on March of the Penguins on this book, on his Penguin edition. Um, now he had a different one, though. He had the, the one with, like, one I just showed you in Paradise Lost, that Black's, the more newer Black Spine editions. This is the original ones, um. And that's the thing about used book shopping. You don't know what you're going to get. Yeah, you can see the picture, but the picture is not a guarantee of which one you're going to get. Um, unless it's like a really special edition. But then you'll have a better chance of getting the one you want. I think. I mean, so far, every time I order like a special one, like a cloth bound or something, and I usually get it. But, um, not always. And like the title says, it's the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And I've heard that Edward Gibbon is a good writer, and it's... I've been meaning to pick it up. But like I said, I need to pick the right time to read it. Like, I have such a hard time. And I think this pile might be saved for March. Because um, the Ides of March are when, you know, Caesar was... Julius Caesar was assassinated, stabbed 13 times, even by Brutus, his bestie. So, um, I thought I, I was thinking about saving these for March. This is what I attempted to do last year. So this year, I think I'm going to stick to it. I'm going to stick to these books for March. Maybe start this one in February. But who No, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to stick with this in March. Okay, so. Next. Come up. Come on. Uh, so hard Okay, so this is the other non-Rome related book. It was like the first history book that was ever written by Herodotus. Um, and it's actually Greek related. It's not Roman. It's the history of the Greeks. So, um, so this is another non-fiction. And I thought, you know, it would be kind of cool to read some of the history, you know, some of the read some of the old his history books like um the old the nonfiction of back then I thought would be really intriguing so there's a quite a bit of nonfiction I I would be reading in March um because one day I'm hoping that I will be able to read nonfiction November book or nonfiction I keep playing on it and it never happens I'll start and be inspired but then I totally fail it 
I meant to read, continue on to the Walt Disney biography that I have, but then it never happened. So, I mean, I did start reading the Walt Disney biography again, but then I put it down way too long. So, but I thought this is cool that they have the first history book that was ever written. Um, I thought that was, that's such a cool thing, you know. Um, and then we have... So this is the actual, this is the actual fiction in Rome related, and this is about Julius Caesar. Um, and this is, we start the first one, the gates of Rome, so everyone, he, Caesar and Brutus were, Julius Caesar and Brutus were young boys under different names. And then, like, I think Julius was like a middle name or something. Um. And then how they ended up in Rome and the position that they're in. And this is like, um, so I'm just going to read, this is The Death of Kings, the second book in the series. There's four books. So let me just read the back. Forced to flee Rome, Julius Caesar is serving in the war galley in the dangerous waters of the Mediterranean, rapidly gaining a fearsome reputation. But no sooner has he had a memorable victory than his ship is captured by pirates. Abandoned in Africa, after hard months of captivity, he begins to gather a group of recruits that he will eventually forge into a unit powerful enough to gain vengeance on his captors and to repress a new uprising in Greece. Returning to Rome as a hero and as an increasingly dangerous problem for his enemies, Caesar is reunited with his boyhood companion Brutus. But soon the friends are called upon to fight. They have never fought before. But a new crisis threatens to overwhelm the city in the form of a rebellious gladiator named Spartacus. And I actually have some Spartacus books for fiction. Um, and I did read a book that was um, a fiction YA version of a female Spartacus. I cannot remember what it's called, but I keep, <coughs> <I'm> seeing, <coughs> <coughs> keep seeing it at the Rose office and think about picking it up again because I did like it, but did I love it? So, okay, so maybe that will be my March TBR. Not the sci fi, I don't know what I'll do with the sci fi. And here's like I said, I have so many options. I, I pick so many options for myself that I have to narrow it down, and I have a hard time doing that. Um, okay, so let me see. What was I? Th I don't, the rest of these categories, I don't know what I was thinking. I just kind of put them together. Um, let's start with these. I do not, like I said, I don't know what I was thinking when I put these together. Um, I guess academics, maybe. I mean, I was thinking academia or something. Not dark academia, just academia. Okay, so first, I knew I had to read this at some point because it was going to drive me crazy because I would keep hearing about this book. And the second one just came out. Um, the Atlas Six by Olivier Blake. Um, so this is basically the idea of the Alexandria Library. What if that didn't burn down? And there's a secret society. So um, you have these group of people who are summoned. And only, I think, six can make it. And someone's going to die. So, um, they are in this big, like, competition, this big competition or something. Um, let me all just read the back, because I'm just terrible at describing. Each decade, only the six most uniquely talented mu 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 ah, cannot, magicians, cannot say that word, are selected to earn a place in the Alexandrian society. The foremost secret society in the world. The chosen will secure a life of power and proceed beyond the wildest dreams. But at what cost? Each of the six newest recruits has their reasons for accepting the society and his intimidation, even if it means growing closer than they could have imagined to their most dangerous enemies. A risky, unforgettable betrayal from their most trusted allies. They will fight tooth and nail for the right to join the race of Alexandrians, even if it means they won't all survive the year. I remember being very, like everybody else, I was very excited when I heard about this. 
Um, and I wanted to wait until it came out on paperback to get it. Because it looks like a chunky book, so. Um, must be a new of waiting, though. Waiting for a book to come out. Because then, maybe if it is the first book in a series, then the sequel might, it might give the chance for the sequel to come out and eventually come out on paperback. Um, so, I am, I've been excited for this like everybody else. I just haven't picked it up yet. Um... Okay, and then we have, okay, so this is a book I started a while back, I haven't picked it up recently, and that is Noah Gordon, The Physician, about this young man who was a, um, wanted to be, um, he gets apprenticed to be a, um, um, where is it, where is it, um, a traveling a barber surgeon I knew he was on here somewhere a barber surgeon he's like he's a con man they can he, he can you know find ways to make you better or something and, and um but he wants to be our main character wants to become a real doctor and but he is Jewish and the good the one medical school the best medical school is is in Persia, but, um, but they will not allow a Jew, they will only allow Christians, I mean, or no, wait, no, he is Christian, and they won't allow him to go into these Muslim schools if he's Christian, so he claims to be Jewish. <coughs> <coughs> Obviously, I'm not gone that far. Um... <coughs> <clears throat> but I really liked it so far. I'm having a good time with it. I found it really fun. I like our main character. Um, but yeah, like I said, I put these together because they're, you know, about studying something and, um, or academics or something. And then this last one, um, is... Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norwell, I have to get back to, um, where you have these two magicians. So, we live in a world where they believe there was a time when magicians existed and magic was real. But now we just have this group of people who, who just study it. And one day this older magician reveals himself. And he, but he needs John, Mr. Norwell and he needs to prove that he's a real magician. So, he does... This amazing feat that proves and everyone becomes obsessed with him and fascinating. He develops a fan base and but then there is this one young magician, Jonathan Strange, who proves to be just as powerful, just as good. And Norrell doesn't like that. He feels threatened by this kid. Um, but he agrees to take him on as an apprentice. And of course, you know, they become rivals. They some rivals more than friends um <clears throat> and i'm really loving this it's so much fun it reminds me of dickens or austin in its writing <coughs> <coughs> and it's just this whole the whole concept and everything is really cool these magicians and magic being real and these um and these characters I have such a I love the characters of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Jordan Norwell. On one hand, they annoy me, and I want I get pissed off by them. But on the other hand, I just love them. They were so much fun, and um, in their arrogance and um, cockiness. But yeah, it's so it's such a great read. Um, like I said, it reminds me of a Dickens or a Jane Austen novel in its writing. Um, yeah, and I, this is a good. This is such, this is great. I love this. Um, and I need to continue with it. Okay, so, let's see. What other piles do I have? Okay, and then we have, so, I was thinking about February. I'm trying to pick some shorter books, but I also found some longer books in there, so. Um, first, I want to kind of go on anti-love or anti-Valentine's Day theme here. Um, with the exception of a few of them. But, a couple of them, maybe. Maybe one, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so first, 
<coughs> well, no, okay, actually, no, because this next one is romance. That one's romance, but, um, first I started as anti-romance. The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. I've been wanting to reread this, and it's not a super long book. Um, I've been wanting to reread it. Um, give it another shot. About a haunted house, basically. This is about a haunted house, and, um, it inspired a movie and a TV show. I think, well, I think there were two movies. The only one I've seen, though, is the one with, um, Liam Neeson as the doctor who's doing the experiment. And you have, um, Owen Wilson, which I did not realize Owen Wilson was in that movie. I mean, I remember watching it, but I didn't realize it was Owen Wilson. And, um, Catherine Zeta-Jones. And I know the woman who plays the main, the main character, but I cannot think of her name. I've seen her quite a few times. She was in Mystic Pizza with Julia Roberts. And I'm trying to think of, and she was also in The Conjuring, the first Conjuring movie, I think. The first one that came out. Um, but, um, I didn't know it was a movie yet. It was based on a book. And then there's the TV show, which is not the most accurate. Um, <coughs> but I want to reread it. And I don't know why I'm picking February to reread it. I'm just going to do that. And then the other one, yes, is actually a romance. And that is Persuasion. I meant to reread it for Jane Austen in July, but I never got to it. And, um... This is a second chance romance. You have our main girl, Anne Elliot, and um, when she was a young woman, she got, she was in love with a sailor, and he was gonna, he proposed her and everything, but she was convinced by her godmother to turn him down because he wasn't good enough for her. And so he leaves, he walks away hurt and heartbroken, and he comes back into her life many years later. She's still unmarried. She has one sister that is married her like her older sister is married with kids and she's an, a younger sister and um the guy comes back into her life and now he's a captain and he's rich and but he has another woman that's in, interested in him that someone's trying that he's being set up with and it's just really uncomfortable and awkward for Anne Elliot and there was a bad a really bad adaptation that came out recently earlier this year um that people are not happy with because it's terrible now i have not watched it and i yes i've read this book twice but i feel like i don't know it enough to, crit to critique um even if like if i agree i feel like if i say oh you're right it's only because i think about what other people say and everything and just agree with them but um I wanted to read it again. I've been wanting to reread it for the third time because it's kind of growing on me as a book. But I thought this would be um, good for February. And then um, here's the other romance. We have Child of Prophecy. Um, it's not, I mean, it's a fantasy, but with a romance. Um, this is part of the Seven Waters trilogy, although it's kind of a series now. Or it has more books. And um, the first one is a, a trilogy. And you have... Each book is about a different member of the Seven Waters family. Like the second book was... The first one was about Zorka. Um, and then... In a retelling of one of, of a fairy tale. And the second one was about her daughter. And then this third one, I don't know if she's related... Um, but yeah, I really like the writing and I like the world of the Seven Waters clan. Um, and usually, so far, the first two books have had romance, so I don't know if this is gonna have a romance or I'm going by from what I remember reading in the back. I think there is gonna be a romance in this, but um. 
Now, I have heard that the books don't, there are some people feeling the books don't get great. You know, they go bad later. Um, but I'm going to see. And a lot of times, I feel differently. Like, if I'm still really, really interested in something, I'm going to give it another shot. I mean, even if I heard negative thoughts about it. But anyway, so there's that. Um, I mean, the problem with February is it's leap year. It's 29 days, so that's the risk of a, um, putting it in February. And then we have, so I thought because these are a collection of short, um, shorter works, um, and plays and stuff, I thought I would include... Um, the collected works have also been a while, so I want to read all of them, but I read some of them. Um, and this says that the collected works of Oscar Wilde, so some of his plays, um, his shorts, his novellas. Okay, so we have, as far as sections, which I did start reading this first one, um, the portrait of W.H., Mr. W.H., The Lord Seville, Seville's Crime, The Modern, The Model Millionaire, The Canterville Ghost, which I've heard a lot about. Um, I don't know exactly what it's about, I, like I couldn't tell you. Um, the Young King, The Birth of Infantata, The Fisherman and His Soul, The Remarkable Rocket, and Poems and Prose, The Artist, The Disciple, The Master, The House of Judgment, The Teacher of Wisdom. Um, and then we have Poems. And lectures. Um, lectures on journal, on America, lectures on art, on literature, essays. And then we have, and then it ends with the um, importance of being earnest. So I thought, you know, reading some of these might be a great idea to read in March. Um, since it's shortest month. Um... Like, here's the problem. The other reason why I have trouble narrowing down is sometimes I feel like, oh, if I put a book back on the shelf, especially if it's a series I'm wearing, I'm going to forget about it. There lies the problem, but I really should be doing that. Okay, and then here's, I'm going to pick two more books. Okay, so then we have, um, we have four more books that I'm picking up for March. I mean, for February, which I really shouldn't do that. I should just focus on the quarters, because that's what I wanted to try to do, is... But I will, um, on quarterly team yards. But I will come back to that minute. What, in a little, or not in a minute, but I'll come back to the later towards the end of the month. Um, so we have The Distant Hours by Kate Morden. Um, I figure, I mean, this is about, like, the children who discovers that her mother during the World War Two had hidden this stay with these two women, these three sisters in in their um their castle. So it kinda has a gothic feel to it. And I I and as always I love K Morn's books and I've been meaning to read read all of them and originally I intended to read all of them before I read um The Clockmaker's Daughter, but I never did, so I read The Clockmaker's Daughter. So now I'm gonna I wanna pick these up this one up in February. Um, because I think, I mean, to some extent, I'm not big on, like, I don't read a lot of romance, so I don't, and it's still winter time at the time of that. So, okay, so then we have <sighs> Son of a Witch. Every time I say that title, I think, you know, people are going to think I'm saying Son of the, you know, the, that other word. B I T C H. Um, so this is the second in volume two in the Wicked Years. This is about this the young man who Lear, who is supposedly Alphaba's son. And his and his, his and, you know, his adventures and whatnot. And I love these covers, I love them that I like how the paperbacks will still do that, not just the hardbacks. Um and I, you know, like I said, I remember reading the first three books, but I barely remember what happens in them. So I thought, you know, rereading them would be a good idea. So you guys know, back in October, I read Where the Wicked. Um, and I think I can get into it more and appreciate it more because of the fact that um, I'm a little more mature 
in more well run more well read or more rounded in my reading so I can appreciate it more um and I've read longer books so yeah so this is this should be an interesting read like I said I loved Wicked I know not everybody loved Wicked and I get why um like I said this is about Lear Okay, and then I got two more books I'm thinking about for February. Okay, so, and they're chunky books. They're chunksters. Okay, I also got to worry about Tome Topple. I have Tome Topple coming up in December. She decided to do it starting tomorrow. Um, so then we have Bag of Bones. So this one kind of has a bit of a love story in it. Like this... Writer's wife died in a freak accident, and I think she got hit by a car. And he is struggling to get back into writing. And he finally goes to the lake house where his wife, where him and his wife lived, where where his him and his wife go every summer to kind of escape. And he runs into this little girl walking that her mom is single doesn't have anyone and the little girl's kind of wandering off by herself because she wants to go to the beach or something and he saves her and um that's the last thing i i read <laughs> but i think he's gonna be haunted by his dead wife i believe and there's gonna be some secrets that he didn't know about her if i'm remembering correctly so um and he's just Stephen King is so great with creating characters that are relatable and believable. And his books are so compelling. I know there's a lot of things that people have issues with with his writing, and his. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, um, I'm just trying really hard not to cough here. Um, but yeah, so I want to get back into this one, and I don't know if I'll read for February. So these. Some of these books I don't know if I'll get to. Like, I gotta really narrow it down. It's just I'm a hard time doing that. So, then we have, um, that one. And the last one I'm thinking about is, um, let's see if I can reach it without, or, uh, for February. I mean, although these might not be right in February. I do not know. Um, okay. Like I said, I really, um, it is middle, my reread of Middle March. This is another one I really enjoy, but I feel like I want to reread it. Um, and this is about these people in this town of Middle March. And, um, it's during the, re the reform bill getting passed. And they're trying to, and these people are going about their lives, thinking about marriage, and trying to make decisions about it. And so there's a lot of political discussions and, you know, the idea and ideal marriage discussions and um one of the most famous characters in this is Dorothea, who thinks that she knows what's best for herself and who she should marry. Um, but that marriage might not be the best decision she's ever made and um she ends up falling in love with someone else. It's just it's really good and I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, but still a very, in very enjoyable read. Um, not a lot of going on, but still very interesting. Well, not like not a lot of exciting things going on in this book still, but like it depends what you like in a book. Like, but anyway, um, again, as you can see, this is another mount, another where I got the cloth bound edition. Um. But yeah, so like, and, um, but so many great characters, and like, I just feel like I need to reread it. Um, okay, so I have a few more piles here. Okay, so there's also I have, um, I just bought this book recently, Elizabeth Costova's The Swan Thieves. This is. She's the author of the story, which I absolutely loved. It was like so, it was so great and so riveting. And this is the Swan Thieves, and um, okay, um, 
Okay, so this richly told, beautifully imagined novel takes a journey, us on a journey into the lives of the women left behind by the renowned painter Robert Oliver. After attacking a canvas in the National Gallery of Art, Oliver maintains a stubborn silence, prompting his psychiatrist Andrew Marlowe to embark on an unconventional pursuit of the answers his patient won't provide. As Marlowe is pulled deeper into women, Oliver's troubled mind, he uncovers a tale of love, betrayal, and artistic obsession, and finds surprising possibilities in a package of 19th century love letters. Does the key to unlocking Robert Oliver's mystery lie in the tr- in tragedy at the heart of the French Impressionism? Across centuries of continents, from young love to last love, Elizabeth Costovo deftly explores the painter's universe, passion, creativity, secrets, and madness, and conjures a world that lingers long on the final pages are turned. But yeah, I really liked her first book, so I feel like I'm going to like this one too. And I'm, I'm a big fan of stories that go back and forth between the present and the past. I love those stories because I love the idea of being able to uncover the past and what happened. Um, and that's, I think, part of why I love Kate Morton, too. She's the same way. She goes back and forth between the past and the present. So, um, yeah, so I want to, so I don't know when I'm going to read this one. And then also, I need to get to The Luminaries by Eleanor Catton. Um, and I can't mean to pick this one up. I keep forgetting, though. Um, and I did start it. Um, a while back. I got to page 94, so almost at 100. Um, I think it has to do with the gold rush. And I don't know if it's a fan. I still don't know if it's a fantasy. It might be just a struggle fiction. But I thought there were some fantasy elements to it. Or maybe a magical realism. I do not know. But um, I loved the writing. I remember really enjoying it when I got it from the library. Um, and I wanted to buy in a copy of it so I could finish it and continue with the story. But, um... It took me forever to, it took me a while to buy it, but I just haven't picked it up. I need to pick it up and continue. Like I said, I really need to narrow these down. Okay, and then you have, okay, so Fire and Blood. So I've been waiting, I want to pick these up within, before the new season of Half the Dragon starts. But this is the history of... The, like a textbook kind of history of the dragon, the house of the dragon family, Dar- to the Targaryens. So it's written kind of like a textbook. And then apparently I've heard from a lot of people that the show is, that this book is based off, based on, or, or the show that was, the show itself, House of the Dragon, that it's like the real story of what happened while this is someone's account, someone's thinking what happened, interpreting it, which I think is a really cool idea on George R. R. Martin's part. Um, then he writes it like a textbook where he interprets it and what happened. And then the show is about what really happened. Especially because like people don't see who these people really are behind closed doors. They don't know their emotions, their feelings. They're just going by what they see. Because a lot of these, the, they will put on a performance and show you what you they want you to see. So it kind of makes sense that maybe the author of this, of this book, on the history of the Targaryens, would interpret things a certain way. Well, that's not what really happened. I think this is a really cool concept and I want to get to it as soon as... Um, before the new show starts so um but i love how it has pictures in it let me see let me take all the dust jacket nope i hate when there's a naked hardback um that's why i always keep dust jackets on because most hardbacks are naked but um i like when there's a picture on the hardback part but anyway so there's this one um That I want to get to as well. But I don't know when that will happen. Um, like I, said, I need to go through all these. And narrow it down. Which is really going to be hard. Um, okay. So this pile is right next to me. I'm going to go through this pile as well. So. Um, 
this was a book that um, Wendy, my sister's roommate, we call her Wings, had sent me. She sent it with Jesse when they um, to give to me. And this is the personal librarian. So I, I think I don't know when she got this book, but um, I remember I kept seeing this at Books a Million and stuff and thinking about it. Um, but I wasn't sure yet. And I think this is a one who a, a woman who is mixed mixed race, and she could pass off as a white. Um, let me see. Okay, so she's one, this guy, or, well, her name is Belle and Costa Green. She's hired by J.P. Morgan to create a collection of rare books, manuscripts, and artwork. <coughs> <coughs> And she becomes very famous but she must protect the secret that she's half black oh um yeah because she's part Portuguese and that kind of helps her and passes white um so, is this a, okay, so I don't know, but, um, yeah, so she is someone who's half, you know, she's Portuguese, but she's also black, so she has to hide her identity, and she gets put in this position where she must protect it, because if anyone finds out, and this is set in the 1920s, so if anyone finds out, they're gonna, you know, they're not gonna respond well to mixed race, so she's, um, yeah, so I thought that sounded really interesting. Um, I don't know if there's a romance. Sometimes they have historical fiction have romance. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, so I thought, you know, historical fiction I feel like is good to read in the winter time. I do not know why. I just feel like historical fiction fits the winter season. And then we have some books. So we have The Witching Hour, which I did start reading in October and I brought it with me, but I didn't continue with it. But this is about the Mayfair witches, and they have a devil on their shoulder. This man in the shadows that follows them around and infects them and makes them do things. And um, their latest, the latest heir is living in California, Rowan. She is a doctor, a surgeon in California, and she crosses paths with this young man named Michael, <coughs> this Irish boy. And he has a near-death experience when he falls into the San Francisco Bay, I'm assuming, and she saves him his life. And he realizes that because of that experience now, he can touch objects and basically get their memory of who used them, what what was going on when they were last used, stuff like that. Um, I think it's kind of a touch-no thing. And he becomes obsessed with finding the woman that saved him. And, but she is, her family's trying to protect her from going back to New, New Orleans. <coughs> <coughs> it's a three, it's a trilogy, and this is the first book, and I do have the second book, and then there's a third book um, that I'm going to get soon. But, um, but I really love Anne Rice's writing. Um, she writes very dark stories. She also writes, like, Interview with a Vampire, the Vampire Lestat, and all that. She writes all those books. Um, so, as you can see, it's a super long book, so I don't know. And the last, but not, well, not last, because I have two other piles. But I also need to, get, as I always say in all these videos, I need to get... <coughs> God damn it. <coughs> we also have Way of Kings. I need to get back to the first book of Randerson, Brando's Andals, Brand, Brandison, Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight Archive series. I need to get to it um, so I can get to the second one. But, um, because before I know it, he's going to start the next next part of the series. 
Um, before I can even finish this first one. So I need to get to it. I need to prioritize this one. But I'm just really bad at that. So um, I, I don't need to say anymore because I keep bringing it up. It's in every one of my videos where I talk about the books I need to read. Okay. Okay, now we have two more piles. Okay, so this is kind of a medieval type pile. Medieval theme. So we have Grace Kings. Ken Liu, I think it's, um, like the Dandelion Dynasty is the series. And I did start it, um, but it's been so long since I picked it up. I'm on chapter four. So I'm just going to read the back. Archipelago Archipelio of Dara was once divided into seven kingdoms, with shifting alliances and constant battles. A tempest of diverse dialects and cultures, and a reluct relentless king united the seven kingdoms, the seven lands, to one empire. Some thought it would bring peace and end the turmoil. Instead, it brought in stagnation and suffering, anger of the gods, and finally a rebellion. Kani Garu is a wily bandit who is more concerned about being well liked than with the affairs of the empire until he meets the ma his match, Gia. This free spirited daughter of a well regarded family sees greatness within Kani. Driven by Gia's love and touched by the grace of the common people, Kani sets out on an unlikely path to heroism and perhaps a daring wager against the gods. Madda Sendu, a last, the last scion of a family of renowned generals, is favored by the gods, standing seven and a half feet tall, broad shoulders and double, broad shoulders and double peopled. Madda looks like a hero out of ancient legends, determined to reclaim his stolen heritage. Madda catches wind of a revolution and begins a journey to become the greatest warrior of his age. Kani and Mana become fast friends, and they wage separate wars against fast conscripted armies and silk draped airships in order to wrest Dara from cruelty. Fans of intrigue, intimate plots, and a sweeping battle will find a new series to embrace in this highly anticipated debut by multiple award winning author Ken Liu. Um, I haven't read anything else by him. Um, but this sounded really cool. I remember. So I need to pick it up again. <laughs> um, and I know the other books in the series, there are like one or two books in the series that have already been out, you know, that were the last book came out. I do not remember. But there is that one that I need to get to. And it's kind of, like I said, this is a medieval theme. Okay, so next one. Okay. Um, we have um, the next this next novella in the um, Rise of Empire Volume 2 of the Ryria Revelations. Um, and this book is The Emerald Storm is book 4. I need to read that one. And I already read the next book and I barely remember it. But um, I'm going to reread I'm going to I feel like I need to read the first one. I mean this next one. Um, it's it's so great to be with these characters. I love Royce and Hadrian. They're so much fun characters. Um, I like um, our female, one of our female, you know, our female lead. She's really awesome and badass and really smart. And um, I still have my theories. I'm still keeping the same theory I had before about it. But I need to pick that because it's not that long anyway. And then we have Clash of Kings by George R. R. Martin. So I need to finally get back to my reread of this series. Um, this is the second book. And I read the first two. I read the first and the second one once before. And I started reading the third one. But I decided to reread it. So I reread the first one. And I've been working through the second one. So I got to pick it up again. I'm going to start reading it again. Um, and I probably not, don't need to tell you about what this one is about because most people probably heard of it. Um, but it's a really fun series and I want to continue with it. Um, where when the chapter with Theon, again, um, he just came home to the Iron Islands. 
and he, there's no one walking him, walking me in, welcoming him with open arms in this one. Um, and he does have a bit of an awkward and uncomfortable encounter with the sister, I remember. Um, so I need to pick this one up again, start over with this. And then we have, not start over, but pick it up again. Okay, and then we have <coughs> Wolf Hall. This is by Hilary Mantel. This is her famous, the first book in her famous trilogy that has won the, um, won awards, won the, um, Booker Prize, I think. Yeah. Man Booker. And the second in the second book I think won or was tied with another book. But um this is the first book. It's book the Thomas Cromwell trilogy and I finally bought it and think about continuing with thinking about and I did kind of start it. It is a bit of a again another odd writing style, but I just need to pick it up and read a lot of it and really get into it. Um I know a little bit about this because I did see movies like the old the um the other Bowling Girl, and I've seen other, but um, this is from Thomas Cromwell's point of view, and I like it. I like learning about this time period, but I just don't read a lot of historical fiction about this time period. Okay, so there's that one, and then this next one is actually a play, and I want to read this one because I have a book that is a um. Oh fix that up later um that is a i don't know if it's adult or ya i think it's adult retelling of this story in the, with a fantasy twist to it but king lear by william shakespeare um i really like these editions these are special these are barnes and noble editions of these and i really like them i enjoy them you know i like the look of them and um this is King Lear, which I don't know a lot about this play, but I wanted to start with one that I was not familiar with. Um, I don't know if this, well, of course, to some people I think that's a bad that's a bad idea, but um, I think it's about. I don't know if he actually has daughters or not, but I think he's di King Lear is dying, and his daughters or possibly sons. Usually it's sons, but maybe I want to say because of that book, the other book, it's daughters. It's to decide who gets the throne, you know, while he's dying. Um, so it's one of his dramas. And um, I want to read it. And then the book I'm going to put it with is The Queens of Innes Lear, which is, is by Tessa Grant. It is a retelling of it, but um, with his daughter's, from his daughter's perspective. I mean, he might have sons, because usually in these stories, it's boys. Usually in these stories, it's about sons. And maybe they just decided, decided to gender swap. I don't know. I'll have, to, I'll have to double check on that. I mean, I'll find it when I read it. Um, yeah, they're all fighting for the crown. Um, you have... Um... And I thought it would be great to pair these together, read the original source material, and then read this retelling of it. I thought it would be great to pair these two together. Um, okay, I've got one more pile to go, then I am officially done. And then I need to go through these again and try to narrow it down again. Um, okay. Then we have this one. Um, this is kind of a creepy section, creepy books. So we have um, Blackmouth by Roland Malfi. <coughs> <coughs> this kind of makes you think of It a little bit more like Salem's Lot where this man is looking back on his childhood and he has to go back to his old childhood town. And, um, find out what, remind himself of what happened when they were kids. 
him his brother and their friends and um that's all i know and i have read a little bit of it see that i always make that same mistake where i'll start it and then i'll be like i'll come back to it later and then it takes me forever to come back um the good news is i don't read that far into it um So, yeah, this said this sounded really intriguing, and like I said, it reminded me a little about of it by Stephen King, and a couple other th you know other stories. Like I love the trope of the childhood, you know, you reliving your past, and having to come back to your past because it still haunts you. I like that concept, that trope. So I figured I'd read that. Um, like I said, I think winter is a good time to read horror books too. Um, okay. Yeah, this one I need to pick up and continue with The Mysteries of Udolpho. So we have this young woman and her father, and they come to stay. They travel across the country to stay with her aunt, and her father along the way dies. And she ends up living with the aunt. And the woman decides to marry her aunt, you know, get married. And the woman, her aunt ends up getting married to this Italian guy on this account. And they're trying to arrange her to marry someone else. And she, and they, the count takes them to his home in the, in the mountains. And she kind of feels trapped there and feels like it's haunted. And um, it has a lot of atmosphere. It's just really creepy and just... Um, and I've read a good chunk of it, but I need to continue with it, you know, start, you know, start reading it again. Um, especially because I'm in the middle of a chapter. That's what, it irks me when I, when I'm doing that, when I'm in, like, in the middle of a chapter. After I put it down for so long, it always irks me. I always feel, <laughs> because it's like, okay, I gotta figure out where I am and what's going on in that chapter. So there is that. I gotta get to that one. It's kind of a gothic horror feel to this, which Haunting of Hell House, I guess, could go in that pile. But I kind of wanted to say. Okay, so. Okay, and then we have three more to go. Then, I mentioned this. Salem's Lot, I've been wanting to reread this. The way, the tagline for this is um, Dracula in the Suburbs. Um, kind of similar, kind of like, um, actually kind of like the movie, the book that just came out, that came out, um, I think it's Grady Hendrix. The book with, um, A Southern Woman's Guide to Slaying Vampires, something like that. Um, but this is, this young boy, this young man, Ben Years, he comes back to his childhood home because he recalls a story from his past. He's a writer, I mean. When he was a kid, where he went to this famous house that was supposedly haunted, and something scary happened. He witnessed something scary, and as an adult, he's a writer, and he wants to come back and maybe write about that, write a fictionalized version of that. And it turns out his haunt, his neighborhood has a new guest in town, and he might be a vampire because all the people in his town are being killed. <laughs> um. And I've been wanting to reread it. But there is one part in particular that always stays with me. And I mentioned this before. Again, the part with the priest. Always stays with me. It, it's just very disturbing. Um, but, yeah. So, there's that one. And then, so this is a non-fiction. So, this was... Um, and I wonder if Jennifer Brooks read this. Read this book. But um, this is In Search of Mary Shelley, The Girl Who Wrote Frankenstein by Fiona Sampson. Um, so I think that this is her biography of, of Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. He was married to Percy Shelley, who was a famous poet. And um, so she's mostly known for Frankenstein, but she's written, she wrote other books as well. And I think she wrote poetry, too. But um, she was this young woman, like, 18 or 19 years old. 
and she in Percy were meeting up with some <coughs> friends and they were each one of them was daring to write something scary and this was our <coughs> this was her response to that Frankenstein was her response to that so she wrote, wrote Frankenstein she was very young at the time maybe 15 or something I don't know and um well I might find out how old she was in this book but I love Frankenstein it's one of my favorites now um, I've been mean to reread it, and maybe I will read it this year, reread it this year. Especially if I reread this, if I read this book. Um, it might motivate me to read it. I have one more book, which is a reread, that I'm going to reread if I can get to it. And that is it. And again, another one that I've started, but put it down. So I re I read this before, so this is a reread. Um, and I've been wanting to do a video where I compare. Um, I did a video where I sort of compared the two adaptations that I've seen: the nineteen ninety and the two thousand and nineteen. I think, I don't remember when the the part one and part two came out of that, but um, I compare those. To, I like to compare them, and now I've been wanting to compare the book. To those adaptations but this is a huge book and it took me over a year maybe longer to re read the first time so um I mean the writing is not the heart it's just long so I've been thinking about that a lot how it's not that these books are hard to read it's just they are so long and you know and sometimes they have slow parts so it's like even though it's not hard to read the writing stuff's not that hard it's still like it can still take me a long time because of the length and because like I said there are parts that might seem boring um and that's why it takes me forever but um yes I want to reread this in case you don't know which most people probably do this is like this group of kids of seven friends they're in their hometown of Derry Maine is haunted by this alien type monster takes the form of whatever you are afraid of he his favorite form is a clown and that's how he lures you to him and or it and he targets when in the night the first part half of it said in the 50s the other half said in the 80s or the early 90s and um these group of kids are the only ones who were ever able to defeat it but it comes back right on schedule 27 years later wanting revenge on these kids and they are now adults living pretty decent lives and they had made a promise at the time when they first defeated it that they would come back if it ever finds a way to come back. Because they're not entirely sure. There are some of them that I think are not entirely sure if it is dead for good. Um, and they promise to all come back together again if they're right and it is not dead. And it ends up happening. Like, and Mike, the one who stayed behind is the one who summons them all back. And the funny thing is, though, when they when you leave Derry, your memory is practically erased. You don't remember. There's, like, a fog over your brain from your, you know, of that time that you were, that you're in Derry. And so we kind of, um, so it's one of these books where we get the history of their, we get the 1950s stuff through, like, flashbacks and stuff like that. Um... There's a bit of a love triangle, but it's not a huge part of it. It's, um, it gets in there, but it's not, like, a major plot point. I mean, it, like, it's really the love story between these seven friends and their bond with each other. Um, which I really, you know, it's such a touching thing, and I want to, you know, I just love these kids, and I want to be their parent. I want to give them a hug. I want to take care of them. Okay, so that is it. Again, sorry with the coughing and all that. Um, it was just, I just wanted to get this video made. I wanted to send you guys a video, upload you, to you guys a video before I got sick, you know, before I got too sick. Because I don't, I mean, so far I feel like I'm going to be okay. It's not going to be terrible like it was before. Because it's like I said, I can take medicine this time. But, um, I don't know. So I just wanted to try to get one out there. So I hope you guys don't think it's a gross or bad video. Um, but anyway, if you guys like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Click subscribe if you haven't already. 
and wish me luck as I narrow down these books and try to narrow them down a little bit more. Um, and I hope you guys are enjoying your reading. And please give a and click subscribe. Um, click the, not only subscribe but the click the click the bell icon if you want to be notified when I post videos. And I will talk to you all later. All right, bye.